All righty, get up. Uh, welcome, Tom. Um, I know we've had a bit of a chat before, um, but yeah, really appreciate you coming on, mate. And um, we're just going to have a chat just about your journey. Um, but I suppose the aim of what I'm trying to do here is to really educate um, my clients and everyone, their followers, on your journey with footy and in particular your kicking um, and any key points you can pass on to them um, so they can take their these little golden nuggets and hopefully progress in their journey. So um, thanks for coming on, mate. No, thanks, Benny. Yeah, have, good to have a chat. We can talk all things footy, bit of kicking. Um, look, I, I went from being a pretty poor kick to hopefully a reasonable kick now. So, um, yeah, I've probably been on the same journey most junior kids have with their kicking over the years. Yeah, and I guess that's why. I've um, been having little chats to you on Instagram and things like that, and you're, you're very interested in kicking. Um, and that's why I think you're a great example because you have improved your kicking from being in the AFL system, you know, for a few years. And it shows that it doesn't matter what age you are, um, that if you really want to improve or hone your craft, um, you can do it. So interested to see. We might get into that later. So just to everyone, I'm sure everyone knows who you are, mate, but... Um, you know, you debuted in 2011 um, from Ballarat, played over 200 games. Correct me if I'm wrong with any of these things. Um, kicked about 154 goals. But what do people, a lot of people probably don't realise with you is that you started your AFL journey more in the um, defensive side of things. Um, can you just explain that? And was that maybe from juniors as well? Or were you from a variety of positions in juniors and they just turned you into a key defender? Yeah, variety of positions as a junior. Um, I did ruck at school footy. I was key forward, key back in the TAC Cup representative footy. I was sort of, look, I wasn't a high, highly rated junior to be, you know, a top 10 draft pick. I got picked at pick 53, and even that was probably higher than I expected. Yeah. Um, so the, the Rebels, the North Ballarat Rebels where I was playing were throwing me around everywhere to try and get some exposure yeah. to, to some AFL clubs to maybe notice me, but... I, the thing that maybe got me drafted in the end was I had a really good um, state screening, so I didn't get invited to the draft combine. Yeah. But they do the state screening for the guys who aren't invited to that, and I had a really good beat test and a, one of the highest uh, running jumps. So those two things all of a sudden stand out to a recruiter going, oh, maybe with a late pick we might take a athletic tall guy who's played lots of different positions and see what happens. So yeah, uh, that was how I sort of got my chance, and I came into Melbourne actually as a forward, um, they drafted me to train with the forwards. Then uh, just before the season started in my first year, at the end of pre-season, they realised they had way too many forwards um, in the AFL side and VFL. The VFL actually just signed Brendan Favola. Yeah. And they pretty much said, look, there's going to be no opportunity for you to be playing much in the VFL. Mm. You'll be playing almost VFL reserves. Um, so we want to switch you down back and, and get you some exposure there. So I started as a defender that way. Played the whole season in the VFL. I actually played the last two games of the year in the AFL, but um, they were almost charity games at that point. So uh, and then started the next year as a defender, but didn't get picked in the first round and got brought up as an emergency in round two when someone went out just before the game and then was lucky enough to play pretty much the next seven or eight seasons in a row. I, barely, I think I missed maybe five to eight games over the next seven years um, playing all as a defender. So... Uh, I got pretty lucky that I got my opportunity and got to keep it, although we were we were terrible. We were one of the worst teams in the league and I was playing full-back, so there was the challenges with that, but um, I was just pumped to be playing AFL at that stage, so that was how I sort of got my start. Yeah, and I guess that, that's how a lot of um, these key forwards, big, big key position players, they get their start through something special, and I talk to kids about that a lot. Like, what is your strength area? What is that special thing that recruiters are going to look at? And for you, it was, you know, that speed, that endurance, that jumping, that athleticism that really draw them in. So I talk to kids about that a lot. Like, find that area and really, you know, let's make that special because that's what recruiters are looking for. Um, and then, you know, we've got to hone in on the other areas as well. When you played down, um, when you played down back, what were the things that you learnt as a that you when you reflect back on that you learnt now where you go okay I'm a forward now what did I learn from playing on the best key forwards because I'm sure you picked up a lot that now you use as a key forward. Yeah, look, I from that time I don't remember a heap, but what's happened in the last two years? I've had three or four games where I've had to be swung back in the middle of the game. So Adam yeah. Tomlinson did his did his knee um, early last season, and I played pretty much that whole game as a defender. Mm. Happened in round one this year. Um, 
might have been Jake Lever or Steve May got injured in round one and I played the, the next three quarters against the Doggies down back. And then it also happened a couple of weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, where I went down and spent a quarter or two down back. Mm. And the thing I picked up from going forward to back was just realising what you hate the forward doing to you when you're a defender. And yeah. it's, it's actually helped me the last, you know, I, I, had a, I wasn't playing my best foot at the start of the year. I actually had a week in the VFL and um, it was the best thing for me because I've sort of realised what I wasn't doing well. And as a defender, you don't want to be taken to a, you don't want to be defending someone one-on-one -on -one at the top of the goal square. You don't want someone who just sprints back to goal flat out when the team, when mm. they've got the ball, because you're just chasing them. You're terrified they're going to get the ball over the top and kick a goal. You don't want someone who's, um, when they go, they go flat out. You, what you want is some bloke who just trots around, doesn't make any decisive decisions, just yeah. sort of ambles around and hope the ball comes to them, Yeah. Um, which is what I was doing a little bit in the first few rounds. So what I've tried to implement has been um, get to a spot, just get to dangerous spots. So for Melbourne as a key forward, we need you down the line out of defence. When we're going forward, get, as I was saying, sprint forward as hard as you possibly can um, and don't run to a, you know, a pocket 40 metres out, get to the top of the goal square and then make a decision or, you know, get to 50 metres out in the middle of the ground and then lead. Just try and get yourself in a really dangerous spot. So that's what I've been working on. And over time, like, you might not, you're not going to mark every ball, but you give yourself enough opportunities, you start to work yourself into the game and you get yourself into contests and um, you can stick. And I, I find myself... Uh, if I get myself to enough contests, get myself to enough spots, I'm good enough to win balls on the ground and I can take a couple of marks in the air and all of a sudden it becomes a good game. Whereas when I'm sort of running around using the athleticism that I think I've got, I sort of run around and do nothing and hope the ball is going to come to me perfectly. Um, and quite and like there are games when it does, but what I've sort of learned is just keep, keep turning up to spots where you can help the team and you get yourself in a contest and you back yourself in to win a few and yet by the end of the game, uh, as a key forward, if you might have 10 to 15 opportunities to win a, a mark or a ground ball and you've come out with a good game, you might get a couple of goals. But if you don't, you've still had a heap of impact on the match. Yeah. I remember talking to um, Simon Black and he said every time that he um, would come out of a stoppage and go onto his left foot, he would just see Jonathan Brown. He was there every time, every time. So, it's, yeah, it's just about – it's a really good yeah. match for young kids um, that I think, first of all, it's a good thing to go down back and play up forward and play a number of roles because I reckon you do learn a lot. Um, like you said, you want to be you want to be hard to play against um, at your team and, and, and as an individual and just that work rate, running into dangerous spots. Um, the more you get there, the luckier you, you'll become. All those messages, I hope we get some young people um, listening to that and current senior footballers because I think – they're great messages, and that, that's why I really implore coaches at junior level to play big key position players like yourself in different spots because I reckon you do learn a lot. Yeah, on that Simon Black point, so we, we talk a lot about have empathy for the kicker. So mm -hmm. kicker's coming out of a stoppage and he's a left footer and he's coming along the left-hand side boundary. He doesn't want, even though you've got space on the inside of the ground and you think, oh, I could lead up there and he could, might get it to me, and your defender might be on the side where you need a lead to. And we talk about just getting through your man and giving him an option. It's not going to be a perfect mark on the chest, but he needs you to just turn up and give him something and make it easy for him. So we talk a lot about that. And, uh, you know, sometimes your kicker can look bad because they've had a terrible turnover, but is, is it his fault? And it's hard to see on TV. Mm. Often it's, did someone lead into a terrible spot wanting a perfect across-the-body kick or did they just turn up giving him something, we get a stoppage, we get it out of bounds and we start again? Yeah. Uh, we, we talk about that a lot. Yeah, no, that's that's, that's Um I suppose we'll wind it back a little bit to your junior days. Um, can you reflect and remember like any of those those coaches that you had that, that had a little bit of an influence or a certain coaching style um, that suited you? Like it, it might have been an individual, like a private coach, or it might have been a team coach. Um, it could have been a parent, someone like that, that really had an impact. And if you can remember what sort of coaching style they sort of had on you, do you remember any of those? Oh, I do a little bit. So Jeff Burdett was the, um, he was the sort of region manager for, I, I mean, I didn't grow up in Ballarat. I was about three hours further than Ballarat in a little country town called Eden Hope. And Jeff Burdett was the guy who managed our area. Um, and now that the, I can't remember like specific technique sort of things, 
I just remember he used to talk about two things. It was competitiveness and gut running. Yeah. And so we used to do a lot of um, a lot of drills of literally one on the old school, just coach on the fence, kicks it out one on one. You've got to get the football back to the coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we did a lot of stuff on just the blokes who run all day are the ones who make like. And back then it was even more so. It was a little. I reckon the game slanted a little bit back towards footballers but at that stage it was the best athletes got drafted because the afl were trying to turn athletes into footballers yeah so there was just so much on the gut running it was sort of the ben cousins dane swan sort of era where guys would just go repeat all day Mm -hmm. um which did turn out to be a thing for me it was that was the reason i got drafted was the running so um that's probably the main message i got from him with that sort of stuff we yeah, can't specific kicking things to be honest, but it was probably 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. You talk to any any recruiter, um, and the number one thing, and I even hearing Choco um, talk about it not long ago, the number one thing they're looking for is competitors. Um, so that's that, um, and then yeah, also that that running ability, which which you've been blessed with, but you've obviously worked really hard at. So, and they're great messages, mate. Yeah. We're um, knew that that was going to be my ticket to get a chance and so yeah. for the last four months before the draft and the combine i just went and ran the ballarat yeah. lake five mornings a week so it's about six k's yeah. and it wasn't very footy specific but i thought i'm just going to run this as fast as i can five days a week and that was what helped me get a good beat test so yeah. i wouldn't recommend that now because there's much better ways to get fit for footy but that was sort of what i thought i needed to do at that time yeah i still i, I still think there is a a good argument that that, you know, 6K, 5K, just to build your aerobic base, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, but I know there are smarter ways to train and things like that. But, um, yeah, I, I love the mindset of a young kid just to go out and do that. And you had an aim to get a good beep test to, to show off your endurance. So um, good message for a younger kid. You know what you're going to get tested at, whether it's, I think it's a yo-yo now, 2K time trial. So, you know, prepare yourself and get, go in with confidence because you'll know exactly where you're at. So that's another good message, mate. Um, one thing I was interested in, we'll get into kicking after this. You know, when the talk, everyone would ask you this question, but I'm more interested in looking at it a different way. A few years back with the trade talk when when um, when all that was happening and then you ended up just staying at Melbourne anyway, thank God. Um, what did you do differently? Because you came back with a slightly different player. Like, did you do something in that off-season after all that chat? Like, was it different running, different, um, you know, skills, craft work? What did, what did you do? Was it mindset? What was it? Uh, it was a little bit of everything. Look, I was pretty yeah. pissed off to start with, so yeah. I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. So I was, and look, I've always trained hard in the off season, but yeah. I changed the type of training. So I'd done. We always give get given a program for the off season, and it's your um, three to four running sessions a week, three weight sessions a week, and the runnings are varied between from hundred meter efforts up to sort of repeat one k's, two k's. So longer, generally longer sort of stuff. And I thought that year that I was. Um, going to get traded and wasn't playing very well. I just felt like I wasn't moving very sharply. Wasn't just wasn't um, didn't feel very dynamic out on the field. And I'd gotten a little bit heavier. I don't know if that was just age. Like I didn't really change what I was eating, but all of a sudden I was three, four kilos heavier than I ever was without doing much difference. So I thought I need to I need to make a bit of a change here. So what I did was I that last sort of six to eight weeks of the season, we were in the hub. I hadn't played much senior footy and there weren't many scratch matches on up in Queensland. There's a couple, but my body was feeling pretty good at that stage. I'd almost had my rest. And so I started running from the first day of our, that we finished in the hub. Um, so I started off with probably a month of just the normal off season running, slower stuff. Me, my wife and my daughter, we were driving back from Queensland to Melbourne. Um, and I was pretty anal about getting a run or weights in every day, which normally for your first three or four weeks the off-season, it's pretty low-key. It might be a bit of upper body weights and a slow jog once a week or twice a week to keep going, or a lot of guys, it's nothing, which is what they recommend. It's just do nothing for three weeks, just live normally to let your body recover, but I thought, no, I need to prove a point here. Um, And then I got a PT when I got back to Melbourne where he knows nothing about footy, or he knows a a little bit now, but... He was really good with like footwork, basketball. He done, he played semi-professional basketball, did a lot of footwork drills that were more like NFL movements, like, like what wide receivers would do, short cone work with balls involved, on the ground, in the air, footwork, everything involved. And I'd do sort of an hour, like 
three days a week, I do an hour with him and then I go do my conditioning running and skills afterwards. So mm -hmm. normally guys might do 10 minutes of agility and then they do their fitness running for 40 minutes and then 20 minutes of kicking. Um, but I thought I wanted to improve this agility stuff. So that's what I, I did every week and made a huge difference. Felt so much better. Um, I did that while sort of changing my diet to go much more low carb, high protein, which helped me lose probably six, seven kilos. Um, and just made me feel so much lighter. So I, did, I felt like that sort of dynamic movement was coming back. And yeah, I did that for the whole off season for three months and then got back to pre-season and ran a, and I hadn't done any long distance running really and ran a really good um, week yeah. four way this and ran a really good time still. So I was really happy with that because I hadn't focused on that sort of running. And then I just sort of, it, it almost gave me a bit of confidence to go back into pre-season because I was starting at the bottom again. Um, yeah. You know, I had to work. I wasn't going to start as the the starting forward in the team, um, but it gave me a lot of confidence that I could go out there and move well. And when I started running around and felt like I was doing well at training, all the confidence started to come back. So um, I reckon that's just amazing. Like, how old were you then, Tom? Were you about twenty seven? Yeah, you know, twenty seven. You know, that that's a, it's a nice time in your footy journey, but. To, to change things up and to try something like that is pretty brave in my eyes. And it's, you know, why not? If you just weren't feeling right and you wanted to see some improvements and you've, this is a big change, um, and I love it because as a forward, your leading patterns and your footwork and for your kicking, it's, it all starts with your footwork, doesn't it? So doing, I have seen you do some of those drills on um, some YouTube things that I've seen, and I've used some of it myself, just copied some of that stuff with the kids because I think it's so important. We really focus heavily on that footwork aspect. Um, and it's interesting that you still got pretty good results with your longer um, endurance stuff with your four by one kilometers. So pretty good result. Yeah, I think for, for most guys, uh, anyone who's played footy for a little while, maybe not for you know your juniors, like yeah. your young juniors, but for anyone who's played for a while, we'll have a natural base of sort of footy yeah. fitness. And yeah. this will, you will get so fit from this without having to do that stuff. Now, I think you can mix it in. And a lot of guys, so that the last off season just gone, I didn't go as heavy on the agility stuff. Just I'd had a bit of a back injury finishing the season. So I was a bit, I did a bit of a mix again where I went a bit more endurance, a bit more footwork. And that's probably the more sustainable way because you do have to be careful. You just go flat out speed and agility three or four times a week. It gets a little bit dangerous with your body. Um, when you start bringing in contact and all that sort of thing. So you've got to balance it. Um, but at that time, what I needed was that to sort of get my movement back quickly and get the confidence back. So, um, yeah, it's what I needed at that time. I'm not sure if you can share this, but just you just um, when you do your, because we do a lot of um, kilometre repeats with our athletes as well, um, particularly in the pre-season, what sort of times are you, like are you aiming for? What are the benchmarks when you're, and, and what's the recovery? So you do one kilometre, how much recovery do you get? And what are your sort of aims? Like, is it three minutes, 30 less? Or what, what are your bench? The very best guys at Melbourne uh, average about three or just over, over the four 1Ks. And you normally get four minutes rest after each run. Okay. So if you, the guys who can keep it around three are really elite with a four minute rest. And this is on grass, not on a track. If you don't know, there's, if it's on a track, you mm. can get them all well under three. Yeah, um, I think my best is around about just averaging just over three mm. in that grass. So, um, yeah. but we did, we we used to do three one k's back early in my career when I was way lighter and in my first or second year, and I think I ran three one k's and did two forty eight, two fifty two, two fifty eight, and was just flying. But I wasn't yeah. I wasn't strong physically. I was just a skinny young kid in my second year who was a good runner at that stage. So yeah. it's a bit of a balance. Um, it is. Yeah, now that's really your position. Really good so, to hear. Sorry, Tom. People are probably around three, like anywhere between three twenty, three forty. Yeah, you, as you're an fine. average on that sort of test is going pretty well for most of these most AFL players. Yeah, um, and it's good. I was actually doing these. You probably would have seen Bell Doors a lot on my um, Instagram. She's a young girl that plays for the Lions. Um, and she's quite a natural anaerobic athlete, like move her footwork and short, sharp stuff really is really good. So we're just trying to build that engine a little bit more. And we did some repeat kilometers. Um, so she'll be interested to hear those times and it gives her, you know, something, something to aim for and a bit of a benchmark for her as well. So, and I'm sure there's a lot of other kids that do those as well. So yeah, that's good. So kicking mate, 
this is probably the main one of the main reasons that I've um, yeah to try to get in contact with you because one of the things that I've seen watching you know watching you a fair bit throughout your career I can definitely see huge improvements and I've got some ideas of what they are but I'd rather hear them for you from you um, so can you let us know throughout your time of when you got drafted in 2011 what have you done what adjustments have you made to your kicking if any like what are the main sort of things that you've tried to work on yeah so first three to four years uh you know when i was just starting out i wasn't a good kick at all um but i was making it worse at that time because look i, I like to uh, i like to bite off more than i could chew on a few kicks early days and i used to kick across my body a lot yep which i still can't do like i'm not talented enough to do a you know caleb daniel spargo bailey dale kick and pull it across my body I just always drop it inside. I, I can't do it. So what I was doing, when you're playing in the back line quite often, you're coming out on the boundary line and you've got to bring the ball inside a little bit. Mm. And I'd always just drop it too far inside, never get good connection. Yeah. I had a higher ball drop when I started um, and it just sort of led to bad results. Mm. So as I sort of went along, I started to make – the first thing that helped me was just make better decisions. Like you don't need to go for – inside 45 kicks from the back pocket, you can just be a bit smart then. Yep. Um, yeah. Take a smarter one down the line and save the more aggressive kicks for when we're sort of back 50 and above. Mm-hmm. We don't have to do them in the back pocket. Mm-hmm. Um, and always for me was getting target, uh, getting body in line with the target. No matter, even if I bloody sold a dummy and cut inside, don't try and kick it across your body. Always get the shoulders square and then I could be a really good kick. Mm. Um, but if I was trying to pull it across, it would always lead to problems. So we did a lot of stuff on what we did earlier was the crane kicking. So one foot stuck in the ground, body forward, just kicking it over up to sort of 40 metres doing that was the was the idea. Um, and that was really good for us with like ball drop, getting body position, leaning forwards and kicking through the footy with some more penetration. Yep. And I actually found when I went forward, I preferred it a lot more because it would be mark and get the ball and then look forward and you'd be kicking in a, you know, 10 and two sort of range. There was none of this kicking across your body. You, it was almost just find where you want to kick it and put it in front, which I liked. Whereas as a defender, quite often you're just trying to find a little stationary target or you're trying to kick it so hard to get it out over the back. Mm. I actually liked the type of kicks as a forward much more. And I, I found that suited my game style. Um, and that's sort of the evolution of kicking it a bit better. In terms of goal kicking, I did none for the first seven or eight years. So yeah. the goal yeah. kicking when I went forward became – I almost – I just started from scratch. Mm. So I just said, well, what's my – route? when I went forward for one week, they said, oh, you're going to stay forward for the last five weeks of the season. I said, well, I better sort of make up a goal kicking routine. And uh, I went with five walking steps and five jog steps. Head, uh, I tried to – my dad always loved Tony Lockett. Yeah, and I, I love like watching his highlights and he goes, you should see how far forward he bends over the footy and how low he gets it. Mm-hmm. So I've always done the low walk-in so that I don't have to lift the ball really, really high and I don't drop it because I would drop it from too high, whereas if I started low, it would stay low. Mm-hmm. So mine, mine just became five walk, five jog, stay low, and the leg should come through straight. I never wanted to see my foot drift on the inside when I was looking at the kick come through. I wanted yeah. to see my toes come through in line that they went as I was walking in. Yep. And they're really yeah. the only cues I ever think about is body forward, down low, the five steps, five jog, and then kick through. Yeah, awesome. And that, for any young forwards that, are, that, are, that listen to this, like, great message. You just got to keep it nice and simple, back your routine in, and just focus on a couple of things. You can't be focusing on any more than probably two or three. Um, and the ones you brought up are very relevant to you and your sort of size and um, development and technique. You, you've got to make it your own. We can't all kick like Tony Lockett. We can't, you know, um, if you look at Bailey Fritch from your team, they're all we're all different, aren't we? Like we, we, but as long as we have that similar routine, I know Jack Rewalt's an interesting one. I put one up the other day. He basically, yeah, it's only just a couple of walking steps and then three, a bit quicker and bang, and he still gets some pretty good power. Um, I've thought about doing that mm. on close shots. Yeah. I haven't ever done it, but mm. sometimes when you're kicking from 15 out, they're the most nerve wracking. Yep. If we were just sitting there having a kick, I would just do a little three step kick to you. 
yep. from 20 metres away. And sometimes that's all you need to do to kick a goal. But yep. do I want to change it and change a routine for that sort of close at this stage of my career? Maybe not. But mm -hmm. if I if I was starting from scratch, I wouldn't be afraid to go, well, my set shot from 20 metres in doesn't need to be this particular. It can just be literally like a little five-step kick. Yeah. And you just kick it naturally and find that it works really well. Like I know that Ben Brown, so Ben Brown has the world's longest run up, but if say he's that. 15 metres, he doesn't do it. Mm. He'll just do a little little couple of jog steps in and just kick it like he's passing it to you. And he goes, well, I don't want to overemphasise it when I know it's just a, a simple kick. So it's funny the way that he does it. You'd think he'd have this certain routine, he'd do it for all of them. But if you've ever seen take a mark from yeah, okay. 10 or 15 metres, he won't do the full routine. He'll just kick it like he's kicking to someone in the crowd. Yeah, because I was just going to mention him and I didn't realise that, so I'll keep an eye out for that. Cause, um, but the one thing you and Ben Brown do have in common is your very hips, shoulders, leg swing, everything is, the momentum is beautiful and straight towards the target. Um, and that's something that my my dad also wanted me to get in touch with you. Um, he's a bit crook at the moment, actually. But, um, yeah, he said, get in. He goes, that forward for, um, for Melbourne, it took him a while because he's 70 years old, so it took him a while to get your name, but he got it. And he said, you've got to get in contact with him because he just has got a routine that just keeps it nice and square, leg swing straight, and that momentum going through to the target. So I think you and Ben Brown have that in common. There's a lot of players that aren't doing that, though. Um, won't mention any of their names, but you would see them on TV where as they kick, their hips and shoulders and leg is going across their body. Um, and I believe that just creates inconsistencies. And I also believe that Buddy Franklin... He's brought it. If you look at Buddy Franklin's kick many years ago, was much more around the body, um, but yeah. now he's very straight. And I understand when you need that more distance. Fair enough. We might open up the hip a bit, but um, I think yeah, I think you're on the right track there. Yeah, I think it gets hard. You've with the swinging across, you've got to be top top tier hand eye coordination to do it consistently. And like, there's always guys who can do stuff differently, and it just freaks yeah. at it. But I know I'm not one of them person. I'm not that talented. So for me, it has to be pretty simple and pretty repeatable. Mm. And the margin for error is better for me because if I don't drop it perfectly, I can have one that spins shit and yeah. still because my leg kicks it straight, it might yeah. still go through. Yeah. And so that was my sort of theory is I need to make this as much room for error as possible because I'm not as good as your Tony Lockett's yeah. Yeah, Franklin. Buddy Franklin's one of the greatest ever. Like he's always he's got the ability to put the ball in. He can do field kicks like that. And as I said, I can't I can't field kick across my body with that. I've never had that ability. So I've got to make it pretty simple to be effective. Yeah. Um, I find the thing that gets me. It's usually not technique when I miss. Usually it's mentality and tight. So I was kicking. A, I kicked. I missed a few early in the season, which I'd normally kick. Mm. and I was worrying about stuff that I shouldn't have worried about. I, one of them, I was exhausted, and I was getting back off the mark, and I was looking at the countdown clock because we've got the 30 seconds, and I was stressing out about it. I'm like, oh, shit, there's 12 seconds left, but mm. I hadn't even thought about what my kick was going to be. Yep. And then all of a sudden, I've rushed in, kicked it, haven't thought about where I wanted to kick it, how I wanted to hold the ball, where I grip it. Like, I grip it. I try to split my fingers on the seam. Yep. So I'm like half and half, get a good purchase, and I can drop it down nice and low. Mm. I just rushed it. I wasn't anywhere near ready because I was thinking about the clock rather than thinking about what the kick needed to be. Yeah, so that's had the focus going in this week was going to be if I get a shot, the key, the focus is don't worry about when the clock is. If you're ready to kick it at 20 seconds or you're ready to kick it at two, <laughs> kick it when you've picked your point and um and be relaxed. So I tried to relax my arms, deep breath, and just go and kick it. And I had a much better result on the weekend doing that. So yeah. that's where I normally go wrong is if I'm thinking about everything else except for what I should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's another great message, and it's something that we try to. We don't really have one routine we teach. We teach. We try to find something that works for each individual athlete. But one of them is get back at the top of your mark, take a deep breath, and just think about the process, and then go through it. So um, it's nice to hear that you're doing that at the top level, and we're passing those messages on as well because um, it is very hard. It's it's a very mental thing. Um, but once you get that routine, I think it's just important. And I love the relax call. Um, you know, and I think that's where you're kicking from afar. You look a much more relaxed kick. Whereas back in earlier on in your career, I thought, I, I personally thought you were a little bit more robotic. It looked a bit yeah, stiff. Very tight shoulders, elbows would be tight. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, what influences? Because I've I've had a little bit to do with him. I'd love to have more to do him do with him because I reckon he's a legend. Um, Choco. So has he had a big influence on your kicking? Because I know I've personally learned a lot lot off him, and um, we mimic a lot of the stuff that he does, and I watch and learn. Um, what's he sort of passed on to you with your kicking? Yeah, his biggest thing is so we don't do much goal kicking with him. We do that with uh, Greg Stafford, but his biggest thing with kicking in general is as soon as you've got the ball getting the ball ready in your hands yep. as your feet are going. So he's huge on, he hates guys when we're doing little kicking drills that kick it with the laces down. Yep. He's like, you guys are good enough to mark it, spin the ball in your hands and get the laces out yep. and have your hands in the right spot while your feet are getting ready to kick to the next target. Yep. So he's always talking about dancing feet, dancing feet and having the hands ready with the ball. Yep. Um, he's massive on the having your body, like your chest forward and then having a skip. So kicking and then skipping through. So I kick on my right foot. That left foot has a hop through, and you land on that left foot again to give yourself some momentum to come through to the kick. Even if it's just a little 15-metre pass, you always want to see a step momentum. forward after every kick. Yeah. What about landing on your kick foot? Does he do that too? He, I think he doesn't mind too much as long as it's whatever it is. It's a You kick, one of the feet land forward. You don't kick and then lean back, and you land back on the back foot. Yeah, that's when I um, I remember doing a coaching course with him many, many years ago when I was in my mid-20s, and um, there was a question about that, and he said, as long as, as long as your momentum's going forward and that your body's in a nice tall position, maybe even a little bit forward, you should be okay. So, Because um, the, the, a lot of the kids that skip, they land, that land on their balance leg, their body goes backwards. Um, yeah. So it's a really important one for kids. We do teach landing on the kick foot as well. Um, and that just allows them just to really keep pushing forward and even get to the next contest. But it really helps. Your longer kicks, your longer kicks, you yep. end up skipping a little bit and landing on that one. Yep. But your little just you get a little switch kick, face up, hit a fifteen meter pass. You're generally just one step forward. That's sort yep. of what we we talk about. Yep. No, it's good. Yeah. So um, anyone out there, I'd yeah encourage you to look at Choco's stuff and that Melbourne put up some good stuff. And you guys use the precision footies, which we do too. We love them. So. Um, yeah, that's good. Um, you've gone through goal kicking stuff um, and all of that. Can I show? I'm going to try and can I show you some pictures of you? Yeah. I'm, if just see if this works. I'm going to share my screen, um, and you tell me. I'm going to go out of this. Can you see this picture? Not yet. No. Is that coming up? No. No. Okay. Um, I'll try share entire screen. Share. Try once more if that doesn't work. I just got some pictures of your the way you used to hold the footy to now, and I just feel now you're a lot more relaxed with your grip, and it's you used to hold it very like upright, but now your hands are almost you know a bit more of an open grip. Um, so I'm not sure if that's the case, but I'd love to show you. Um, what I'll do is, what's that? I know what you're talking about. I used to, I used to hold the ball on set shots where I'd have the seam of the ball down my ring finger. Yep. And hold it down, downwards, so that, and that was sort of part of. When I started simplifying everything, I just wanted to be, that's where the ball wants to hit. I'm going to drop it from that position yeah. so I minimize all the range of errors. Yep. But I was finding, especially when the ball was slippery or like I can't, I'll, I can hold the ball with one hand when I split the seam like that, but I can't hold the ball. Yeah. Pulls out when I've got it on the seam on that ring finger. Yep. So my thinking was, well, if I want to control the ball down further, I want yep. to have to split the fingers across the whole footy like you're holding a basketball almost so I yep. can palm the ball. Yeah. And that was my theory on changing it. I'll just get a footy. Hang on. Got one of my kids' ones. So, yeah, you were very much sort of like, like the ball was yeah. on that sort of angle. But now I reckon your hands are sort of more like that. Yeah. Yes, and I, I try not to swing the ball up. I know you sort of teach pushing forward and down. Yeah, I try not to do it too much because I bring in a bit more room for error. So that's why I yeah. try to keep low. 
and I try to like I still naturally have a little bit of a rise, but I don't try to do like a Tex Walker who really lifts it and pulls it down. Yeah, and but you still when you when you push it, I've got some videos where you do definitely get the ball like on an angle or even a horizontal, like it yeah. might be like that. Yeah. And then you follow, and I think that's why now you've got a little bit more control on the way down, um, whereas before you, your hand was just like that the whole time and it was just sort of falling out. Yeah, which is yeah. at slow speeds is still fine, but when you are running at speed, it's much yeah. easier to control the ball when you can hold the ball with the whole hand like that. Um, yeah. yeah. And get, I reckon it gives you a little bit more penetration on your kicking because you can get over the footy a bit more. Yeah, more momentum through it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's where I sort of noticed the difference with that group. Yeah. So I'll, yeah, I'll show you. I'll send you some of those photos anyway because I've got a good one of a comparison um, of you. And I'll, I'll see if a, I don't know if you can sort of see that. Yes. See yeah. 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 See the just slight difference there. It's the one more of an open grip compared to the one like you're holding it a bit more like a a bucket type thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that's they're sort of the ones that I see. Um, and then this one here, like this is you on the run. Um, and it, I know it's looking probably opposite there, but that's that angle of the ball you get. Um, yeah. I think I put that one up on Instagram um, about six months ago. So, um, yeah, there's definite changes there. And good on you, mate, because I reckon, you know, for a 20, you know, you might have changed it in your mid-20s and you would have had to work. People probably don't realise how hard you have to work to change your kicking technique. It doesn't just happen. It takes hours and hours, doesn't it? Yeah, we would have done, I remember my first five years after training, so you train and usually they give you five or ten minutes after training for your own time. Yeah. But I would have done, after every session, four days a week with like Chip Frawley and uh, yeah. Troy Davis and a few others who were there, Jeremy Howe, we would have done an extra probably 70, 80 to 100 kicks each of those sessions. And so you yeah. get 400 extra kicks a week um, doing those after each session, whereas now I... You know, now I'm usually working on contested marking or footwork or something. But, yeah, for those first five, six, seven years, you would do hundreds of extra kicks a week. And we do craft sessions in the afternoon where you're just practicing Choco stuff, where you're just getting hundreds of little 15-metre touch kicks in. Um, just so much better for your hands and your footwork. Yeah. And now it's a lot of, yeah, contested marking and goal kicking practice. But yeah. So yeah. that little kicking practice we did early in my career. Yeah, and I'll, that stuff that Choco's doing, and I, I think it's like surely other clubs are going to follow, like get a person in that that's their area and they can root, because you can see the, the skills of your team at the moment under pressure, decision-making, short, long, medium, like it's just, it's a level above at the moment. Um, the Brisbane Lions are getting there, but I think you both those teams there like are really honing in on that kicking craft. Um, I think other teams will follow. Well, it's funny, we did so much. Well, we were considered, in 2018 when we were playing well, mm. we were still considered a pretty poor kicking team and that was the criticism. We weren't very skillful. We were all contest-based. Mm. Um, and we used to do, so, we just work on contests. We'd do small little handball games in tight areas. Every craft or touch session we do would just be about flicking the ball around with hands and working in little boxes, whereas we would do very minimal. It was almost, you were looked down upon back then if you didn't get in an extra hour a week of touch with your hands doing handballs. <laughs> Whereas now it's almost the opposite. It's if you're doing that stuff, you're just sitting there doing nothing. You might as well go and practice doing some proper kicking in that we've got an indoor craft center now, which is awesome. But yeah. the guys who are working their game are usually ones who are doing uh, kicking inside, doing handball drills where it's just one ball. Whereas we used to do the ball stuff where there'd be, you know, five balls going at once and you're going as quick as possible. Yeah. Because now it's about, well, let's do stuff that's actually relevant. So we'll throw a ball off a net, pick up a ground ball, you've got to get your feet sorted and hit a kick. Yeah. Like you would in an actual game, not having five footies fired at you as quick as you possibly can to catch it. Yeah, that's it's made us so much better with our kicking skills, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That there's a place for that stuff for fun. Um, but to me it's a bit of a gimmick. Um, I love that game specific stuff and that's why getting people like Choco from a, like a, me as well, like from a from a teaching background that can really teach a progression and they can follow it through and design you know appropriate game specific drills. I just think it's brilliant. Now, I love to hear. My dad will be happy with this too because he's always said bloody AFL teams they spend too much time handballing and doing all this stuff. Kicking is king. Like let's you know let's get that going and it's good to hear that you guys are doing it and it works. 
Well, I think a, there's a baseline when guys come into AFL. Most guys can handball and handball yeah. opposite hand pretty well, but not many are elite kicks and few can kick on their opposite foot. So mm. it's there's so much more to be gained, I think. Like for every hour you spend on it, you get so much more in return for working on the types of kicks that um, – yeah, that we do now in training. Yeah, and Choco will do. I do the same. Like we'll just as many variety of kicks as we can think of, and that's it. Any any kids that go for a kick in the park, think for as many different things you can: roll balls, throw it up, push back, switch kick, forty five, um, as many different things as you think happen in a game. Just try and replicate it, and it, it's as easy as that. And you just get as many yeah. as you can. Yeah, no, it's awesome, mate. All that advice is just gold, I reckon. So hopefully, um, hopefully the young kids are listening, and we'll we'll um, do this up for them, and, and it'll make a big difference. Last couple, mate, because I know you got to feed some bottles to kids. <laughs> What's your obsession with meat and steak and cooking? Because it looks every time I look at it, I get starving on your Instagram. It looks amazing. Well, that was sort of part of my um, the way to lose a bit of weight was that I'd done a, a version of that before, like more of a keto diet, which is a really high fat, low carb diet. And I'd found that works well to control body weight. But I, this time I went more, it's sort of called more of a carnivore diet where it's hmm. high protein, moderate fat, low carbs. And I found it so effective to lose weight. Now I don't do that exclusively anymore. Like I, so last night I put on a um, a brisket in a slow cooker in like a red wine beef stock sort of thing. And then I had that with mashed potato tonight. So when I was doing it last year, I wouldn't have been as – I would have been no mashed potato, just the meat and the sauce. Yeah. And But I sort of got to a point where I'd lost the weight I needed to lose. If I kept doing it, it would almost become detrimental. So now I try to – and it's because I did, I just love meat. I love doing steak. I love doing smoked meats and slow yeah. cooked stuff. And now I try to cycle in my food around training. So tomorrow's our main training day of the week. It'll be pretty, pretty. It won't be long, but it'll be pretty intense with some speed work and then a solid weight sessions after afterwards. So I'll have some carbohydrates tonight mm. and um, have that with my dinner. And then the next day or so, I'll go back to more just meat and veggies sort of thing. Yeah. And the day before a game, I'll go back up again with rice and potato before a game. So yeah. that's how I sort of cycle my week. A little bit before the training, a lot before the game of carbs, and then the rest of the week, just lots of protein. Yeah. Yeah, if anyone, uh, again, get on Tom's Instagram and have a look. Um, some of the stuff you cook there is just amazing. Could be a future thing after footy, mate, cooking show. Possibly, yeah. But yeah, it's great. Bloody love it. Um, two more. So just it's a very stock standard question, but – You've given already so much good advice for young players and current senior footballers. What's some, like, if you were just give, like, one or two pieces of advice for young females and males coming through the system um, that are aspiring to play as, as good a footy as they can, what, what would it be? Uh, well, look, it probably depends on the age group, but yep. I think... Like, um, just about to get drafted, like, that's 16. Just about to get drafted. Yeah, okay. Uh Look, it's still a ways to enjoy yourself because I think it becomes so stressful at that stage that it can bog you down with the, the stress of oh, wanting to make AFL and all that sort of thing. So I, I still think you want to enjoy it. But I liked what you said before about find what you're good at mm. and really just maximise that. Don't let coaches tell you that you can't play because you can't run or because you can't kick or whatever it might be. If you're an unbelievable runner... Make sure you fucking run all day. Run up and down the wing and get yourself the footy 30 times and you can work on the kicking. Oh, yeah. if, you're, if your ability at the moment is your power, use your power. And if you need to work on your endurance, you can do that. But um, find what makes you stand out and that gives you a chance. That just gives you – like, look, there's guns who are going in the top 10 in the draft who've got – they've got everything. <laughs> We're not probably talking to guys who are doing that. Or no. girls. So yeah. for everyone else, you've still got something that you're better at than most of the competition. Yep. So find how you can use that in a game, um, maximise it, and then you can work on the other stuff. If it's a kicking, there's ways to get better. Like there used to be a bit of a myth in basketball that shooters would never learn to shoot, but that's almost been that's been broken now. And I think it's the same with kicking. Yep. Um, I think it's the same with most, most things in football. There'd be guys that go, oh, he's too skinny, he can't, get dry, he can't put on size. But everyone who gets to an AFL system, if they're disciplined, if they do their gym work, if they eat well, they can get on body size and make it to be an AFL player. So... 
Um, if it's running, I've seen guys get go from terrible runners to just adequate enough, and that's all you need. If you're just enough and you bring other stuff, you can play AFL. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Living proof of it, you know. You, I think this listening to your journey, you were living proof that you looked at those strengths of running and that athleticism, and you just smashed them before the draft camp, and that's what got you drafted. And now you've honed your kicking, your contested marking, your agility, all those things, and you're becoming a complete player. So it's it's, it's awesome. Okay. I'll say one more thing, and it's usually it's what makes blokes stand out when they get drafted. So, and it'll be the same in any rep squad. Mm. It's the kids who turn up not with an attitude, but with you can tell there's like a bit of steeliness to them that they have a crack at everything. So, they might turn up and they get given the four one k's. You can tell the guys who just go and have a real dip at it straight away, and they give it everything, and it catches the eye. You can tell the bloke who isn't afraid to try his hardest in the first day of training or the first time we see him. Mm. They stand out just because their work ethic, because they've got a bit of resolve to them. There's something a bit different because yeah. they just, they come in there and they go, nuts nah, stuff it. I'm going to show them that I can play. Even if they're usually not that talented. Like I remember when Tom Sparrow got drafted, mm. he came in and he just started hitting body straight away. And everyone's like, holy shit, this kid's going to be good. And it's taken him sort of four or five years, but now he's a bloody good AFL player. Yeah. And he was a guy who wasn't a good kick when he started and now he's a really he's actually a really good kick now mm. but he's a great AFL player and he just came in and there was something different about him because he wasn't afraid to go and hit senior blokes at training and tackle hard and yeah so the guys who stand out early you make a name for yourself and then you give yourself a chance yeah and that comes back to that competitiveness doesn't it like that's what I'm looking for if I'm recruiting and that's the first thing got to be a competitor um, and it sounds like he's a, one of the best ones. <laughs> yeah, he's phenomenal. Yeah. All right, mate, quick seven questions, and you, you can't think about them too much. Best field kick in the comp? Spargo. Good one. Best set shot? Uh, I think Benny Brown is. Yep. Um, best player you've played with and against? The most talented I've ever played with was Liam Jara. Yep. Uh, just did extraordinary things that I've never seen yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, the hardest to play against was actually Jared Ruffhead when the Hawks were winning flags. Yeah. Because he was good market, unbelievable kick. He would go to stop every forward 50 stoppage. He'd go and play like a midfielder. So he would just lose you in traffic. He could do everything when they were good. Yeah, he had threats everywhere, didn't he? Yeah. Um, current series you're watching? Um, time with kids. <laughs> I don't watch series actually. No, I'm, I'm a big YouTube watcher. I just love getting. I get home and watch short YouTube clips and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, I recommend one. What I'm not. A, I don't like car racing at all. But the F1 series on Netflix. Is... I have watched that. Yeah, I just finished that recently. That was good. Good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, favorite uh, favorite AFLW player. I actually love Libby Birch from Melbourne. She's oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Actually, although now Taylor Harris has probably got it because when Taylor Harris is marking the footy, how good is it? <laughs> it's like seriously powerful. Yep, yep. This it's, like what, it's like what Gorney's like when he's marking it. When Charlie Dixon, when those guys are jumping at the footy, that's what she looks like. Yeah, awesome. Favorite sport other than AFL? Uh, NFL. You yep. still love basketball, but I've gone to NFL now. Yeah, I'm a bit the same. Who do you support? <laughs> You'll think I'm a bandwagon, but I'm Tampa Bay. Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> The year they, they were on Hard Knocks, my wife and I went to um, America and we saw a Tampa Bay game that year. So. Awesome. Oh, yeah. well, I follow the New York Jets, so there's no love. There's uh, nothing happening there. I feel like every Aussie does just because they've gone to New York in their holidays and they've gone to a game. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last one, favourite athlete apart from AFL? Tom Brady, is it? <laughs> nah, I do like Brady, but favourite athlete... God, I have to think about it a little bit. Mm. Um, who do I watch in the NFL? I like watching NFL clips. So, so when I was doing the footwork, I liked watching like NFL training clips. Yeah. And the guy who had the best footwork ever was uh, Chad Ocho Cinco, yep. you know, the crazy guy for the Bengals. Yeah. He's if you ever get bored, go and watch some of his footwork drills from when he was playing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just like mesmerizing. So I love watching his stuff on YouTube. Yeah. He's a psycho. <laughs> that's great hey mate I really appreciate it thank you I probably went a bit over than what I said but you just it's, it's 
so interesting and um, yeah, hopefully this, this, this gets out there to as many young female and male um, athletes, but particular AFL athletes, because I reckon you've got a wealth of knowledge and I really do hope you get into some sort of coaching in the future after footy. I know that's a long way away, but, um, you know, if it's private coaching, I reckon you, you'd, it's really rewarding to do that. And um, you'd be amazing, mate, to pass on your knowledge and things like that. So thank you very much, mate. I really appreciate it. No worries, Benny. Thanks, mate. And uh, yeah, we'll have a chat later in the year. Good on you, mate. I'll come down for, for some of that meat. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. See you, mate.